Welcome to the Jay Martin Show, where we dissect the greatest minds in geopolitics and finance. Now, in geopolitics, one of the number one conversations that occurs on my channel and many others is, in an increasingly conflicted and competitive world, what will become the fate of Taiwan? Locked in tension between the world's two global superpowers being China and the United States. Now, I've heard a wide variety of opinions on this topic from many different guests, none of which provided me with as much knowledge, background, and context as my guest today, Professor Warwick Powell. He is a senior fellow at the Taiha Institute in Beijing and an adjunct professor at the Queensland University of Technology. And today's interview is an absolute wealth of knowledge. We go very deep into the subject matter, and I guarantee you, you will be provided with more background and knowledge on the South Pacific than any other piece of content you've seen. That's my promise to you. And I think a lot of the answers are going to surprise you to the questions you may have. Anyways. Here is Professor Warwick Powell on The Jay Martin Show. Enjoy this one. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am with Professor Powell. Professor, it's fantastic to have you joining me today. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. Absolute pleasure to be with you, Jay. I'm looking forward to it too. So there's a handful of directions I want to go, but um, where I want to start is let's start with Taiwan. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll ask you sort of a big open-ended question to kick things off, and then I'll pull on threads. Uh, a lot of the conversation on my channel with my geopolitical-centric guests talks about whether or not Taiwan should be arming themselves right now and um, relieving the U.S. of the obligation to protect them in the event of a Chinese invasion of some sort. Is that an accurate question to be debating? Is that missing some major headlines? What's your take on that concept? I think what's often missing in these discussions is a sense of historical context and how it is that we are where we're at today. I think the first thing to remember is that the question of the island of Taiwan relates fundamentally to an unfinished civil war concerning who runs China and ultimately um, who defines what the sovereign jurisdiction of China is. And this civil war um, has, uh, in a sense, quasi concluded or concluded 90% or thereabouts in late 1949, early 1950, when the communists prevailed and the nationalists, who at that stage was the government of the Republic of China, retreated to the island of Taiwan and a number of other smaller islands in the Taiwan Straits. And when they did that, the aim wasn't to go and establish a sovereign country in their own right. The aim was to reconstitute their forces to enable them to continue the civil war with a view to reclaiming the mainland and re-establishing a comprehensive Republic of China administration. Now, 70 odd years onwards, we know that that actually hasn't happened. But between 1949, 1950, all the way to 1990, 1991, the Republic of China administration that was based in Taipei continued a policy um, which aimed at, if necessary, a, um, a military attack on the mainland to to regain the mainland. So I think that that's the first thing to bear in mind, that this is a civil war issue that has involved contesting parties, um, both of whom have had a desire to be the ultimate victor to run the show. Now, since 1991, the Republic of China administration has uh, arrived at a policy view or a strategic position that an aggressive attempt to retake the mainland is not on, is not a viable position to sustain, and therefore they adjusted their position to a defensive posture, which is to be able to hold their own for the foreseeable future. But again, bear in mind that this is still a civil war context. The Republic of China, uh, as, as a creature, as a sovereign creature, um, is governed by a constitution, and that constitution came into effect in the 1940s, uh, 
and was amended in the 1990s in a couple of important ways, but also at the same time maintain a very strong continuity of what the Republic of China was and is. The amendments that were undertaken in the 1990s enabled uh, the a, a specific series of definitions to be incorporated in relation to the territory of Taiwan Island itself, um, which framed the territory of Taiwan Island itself as part of essentially free China. And then there was the communist occupied China. Mm -hmm. right? So there's free China and communist occupied China. Now, the constitution of the Republic of China also provides for mechanisms by which the Republic of China can alter its territory. Right? And this is an important part in this discussion because these mechanisms exist so that there is a lawful mechanism by which this particular sovereign entity can go about making changes to the territories that it claims to govern. Now, it claims to govern actually a very large swathe of territory covering what is today the People's Republic of China, together with a number of other territories that the People's Republic of China have actually reached agreements on with neighbouring countries to no longer dispute. So there's sections of Mongolia, for example, that the Republic of China, in terms of its own cartography, continues to lay claims to, just as there are a range of territories on the China-India border that the Republic of China claims, but the People's Republic of China doesn't claim. The mechanisms by which this territorial change can be made is a two-step mechanism. The first step is for the legislative UN, the parliament of the Republic of China, to pass a resolution to change its territory. Within six months of that, there needs to be a referendum. And those who can participate in the referendum are the, the residents of the free China parts of the Republic of China. So it defines who can participate in a referendum and it defines a mechanism. Right now, there is absolutely zero capability for the legislative UN to have the, any, to, for a party seeking to amend the territories of the Republic of China to actually get the numbers to even fulfill the first step. So mm -hmm. I think that that's the first thing to remember. Now, far be it for me to dispense advice to, you know, the Republic of China about what it should or shouldn't do. But given that historical context, it is understandable that the Republic of China will continue to maintain a position in the context of an unfinished civil war to at least be able to defend its position until the civil war can be resolved by other means. Right? Okay. That's where we're at. That's where we're there at. are other, okay. other parts of this, and it goes to America's attitudes towards the island of Taiwan, which perhaps we can get into shortly. I'd, I'd love to. And so the Republic of China, what, Taiwan, versus the People's Republic of China, mainland China. And, you know, what we just discussed was uh, the Republic of China, Taiwan, wishing to maintain their position in an unfinished civil war, still claiming to govern major swaths of, of mainland China. Um, and they have some legal means, I guess, to trigger, uh, I guess, almost like democratic outcomes of governance over mainland China, swaths of mainland China is, if I understood that correctly. Well, basically, we've got to make some important distinctions. There's sure. geographical questions, defined territories. Um, the second one is legal sovereign jurisdictions, and they're not the same thing, right? And this is why the issue of the island of Taiwan often confuses people. The island of Taiwan is a geographical feature. It is not a sovereign feature. Sovereignty relates to either the People's Republic of China or the Republic of China. And both of these sovereign entities don't recognise each other. That's an mm -hmm. important point to remember. And they both make claims over geographical territories that overlap. Yes. This is the nature of a civil war. Right? Yeah, so they right. both make claims over a territory that overlaps pretty much 100%. As I mentioned, the ROC, Republic of China, actually makes broader claims than the People's Republic of China does in relation to some 
um, territorial edge issues and also Mongolia, which is an interesting case in point. So we've got geography and then we've got sovereign legal questions. And, um, and we've just got to keep those two issues quite distinct. The fact that there is an island makes it easy for people to conflate these two things, but these are quite distinct things. Okay. Okay. Understood. Thank you for that. Now, I guess that there's two directions that I want to go from here. Yeah. Um, the first is to ask you if there are any parallels between the China Hong Kong dispute that we saw materialize in 2019, which seems like a, a lifetime ago, given everything that's occurred since 2019. But at the time, this was front page news everywhere and sanctions were being imposed and, you know, protests all over the street. But, you know, as I understand, you know, uh, there are some parallels in terms of the, um, uh, I'll put it to you, do you see any parallels between these two scenarios? Well, there's some historical parallels too. So again, um, context becomes very important to understand why it is that we're where we are. And the historical parallel is that both of these geographical territories were historically subject to foreign colonial control. So in the case of the island of Taiwan, it was subordinated to the Japanese from the late 1800s through to um, 1945. In the case of Hong Kong, it was a colonial territory of the British crown until 1997. So both of these territories were actually recognised as part of something that we call China, whether it was Qing Dynasty China, the Republic of China, and subsequently the People's Republic of China, that were occupied by foreign powers and have been returned to um, a Chinese sovereign control of one sort or another. In the case of Hong Kong, the return of Hong Kong Island and its other uh, territories to the sovereign control of the People's Republic of China took place in 1997. As for the island of Taiwan itself, it was returned by the Japanese after the Second World War to the Republic of China. And the People's Republic of China sees, as a result of the Civil War, that the People's Republic of China is the successor sovereign administration to the Republic of China that has sovereignty over the same territories. Um, so that's the first parallel. The second parallel, I guess, comes into the question of how and in what ways does um, one country, two systems manifest itself? So there were campaigns, as we know, during the course of the 2010s uh, in Hong Kong, uh, some of which people, some people would argue were largely uh, US NED funded uh, destabilization efforts, color revolution efforts. Um, others would talk about local agency, et cetera, et cetera, right? But there's a, there's a historical debate about the actual nature of the, 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 the protests in Hong Kong at the time. But the end outcome has been that the protests have been quelled and that the, uh, and that Hong Kong and its territories as a specifically defined administrative region remains a part of the sovereign territory of the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. The question will be whether or not um, the island of Taiwan, as a part of the sovereign territory of a single China, in this case still run by a group that holds on to the Republic of China constitution, but whether or not at the conclusion of the civil war uh, what that begins to look like from a politically administrative point of view and from a governance point of view. Right? And they're going to be the questions that I think uh, the island of Taiwan will uh, be increasingly required to address, just as the folk on the other side of the straits will be exercising their minds around as well. Okay, so... Let me, let me ask you, um, 
given the geopolitical tensions that exist today that didn't exist 10 years ago, is some sort of a conclusion of this civil war uh, something you'd expect, some sort of a, a shift in governance? And uh, and who are the stakeholders involved in that scenario at this point, other than obviously the Republic of China well, and the People's Republic of China? There are sort of three broad possibilities, right? The first one is this idea of the status quo prevailing for another duration of time. But we've got to bear in mind that the idea of a status quo is actually not a static idea. What constitutes the status quo clearly evolves through time and is affected by the changing context, uh, both in terms of the economic power of the mainland um, compared to its situation 30 years ago, for example. Uh, so that's one possibility, is that we successfully kick the can down the road um, and that, <clears throat> for all intents and purposes, people carry on um, as they have for quite some time. That's one possibility. Okay. The second possibility to bring the civil war to an end is a mutual agreement um, around uh, uh, this question of sovereignty. And that can be done peacefully um, or, of course, uh, to conclude a civil war where there is clear disputes over territorial sovereign control, it could be done violently. There is no armistice and there is no peace treaty in place. This is not like Korea. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, of these three possibilities, uh, which is more likely, which is more preferable? And as your question alludes to, um, how do these distinct potential outcomes affect different parties? As it is a civil war, the relevant stakeholders, of course, are the parties on both sides of the Taiwan Straits and their populations. I'm aware that there is always a line that's run, particularly in current times, that, you know, the, the, the residents of the island of Taiwan deserve a say, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a basis for making that kind of an argument. But that argument is usually run with a quiet, assumption or the or the unspoken counterpart which is that the 1.4 billion people that live on the mainland are not stakeholders in the outcome of the island of taiwan and given that it's a civil war the 1.4 billion people that live on the mainland are stakeholders right? this is a civil war if it wasn't a civil war the issues would be different but it's a civil war so the stakeholders, first and foremost, are the parties on both sides of the straits and the, and the populations that are currently domiciled um, on these two geographical territories. I mentioned earlier that the United States has also had a particular attitude and view towards the island of Taiwan for many, many decades. And in that sense, the United States has always been a stakeholder as well. And... And the way I frame the question of the United States attitude towards the island of Taiwan is that the island of Taiwan has fulfilled largely one of two roles historically for the US. It's either been a launching pad to pursue its the US's ambitions in relation to China writ large, or it's been a bulwark as a way of holding back any risks or threats that the US deems particularly communist China to be. So the idea of it being a launch pad really relates to a particular historical attitude that the United States, going back well over a century, has had towards China writ large, whether it's the mainland, the mainland and the island of Taiwan, but China writ large. And that has been part of a proselytizing mission, which has largely been anchored in the idea of a spiritual war. So in the late 1800s, American Protestant missionaries in particular began to swamp China mm -hmm. with a missionary purpose, which was to convert China from being a godless oriental society into a civilized god-fearing 
society. That spiritual warfare was prosecuted through the work of missionaries well into the 1930s. So much so that, in fact, Chiang Kai-shek, who was the leader of the KMT, the leading party of the Republic of China, converted to Christianity together with his wife in the late 1920s. And there were arguments in that period of Chinese history that, in fact, the mission of the Republic of China was to build a China that would be a Christian nation. So this was the American spiritual proselytizing missionary uh, purpose that was associated with China writ large during the course of the 20s and 30s. Now, come 1949, most of the missionaries were being pushed out as the civil war unfolded and as the Republic of China KMT forces were losing um, the civil war, the missionaries were pushed out and they largely went to Hong Kong and the island of Taiwan. Some left altogether. Others set up shop in both of these places with a view that they would be used as launching pads to retake China when mm. conditions were better and they were ready. Now, McCarthy, right, in the 19, in early 1950s, 1951 from memory, in a speech that he delivered. So this was the, one of the earliest um, uh, McCarthyist speeches about the, you know, the communist threats and communist risks. Actually spoke of Chiang Kai-shek as our guy fighting our war. And what he meant by our war was actually a spiritual war. It was a war of missionary civilizational purpose. So Chiang Kai-shek as the figure that embodied the Republic of China that ultimately domiciled in Taiwan was part of a spiritual warfare and a missionary objective. And that missionary objective continued to play a very significant role throughout the 1950s and 1960s in terms of how the US body politic related to the question of Taiwan. Because you'll remember at the time, in the 1950s, the big debate broke out in the United States in parallel to that broader anti-communist stuff from McCarthy was the question of who lost China. Right, so the who lost China debate, which saw Truman come under incredible political attack together with his sort of foreign advisors, um, was part of this lament that the Christian civilizational purpose failed and that the United States had lost China and it had lost China not just in a geopolitical sense which I'll touch on shortly but in a spiritual sense. Now the island of Taiwan has played a really important part in the way that the United States has always thought about this. Obviously in the late 1940s and into the 50s it was seen as the, the bulwark. It was a launch pad and a base to operate from. But the US had actually identified the island of Taiwan from the early 1940s, about 1942, 43 onwards, as being pivotal to the US's own position and interests in that part of the world. And in 1943, the Department of Defense and the State Department actually began drawing up plans about how the island of Taiwan would be governed in a post-war environment. And the big question between these two departments, American departments, recall, was not whether or not Taiwan would be occupied by the Americans. That was the given. The plan was to occupy Taiwan militarily. The debate that was taking place was twofold. One was whether or not a Chinese front was needed or whether or mm. not the Americans would just occupy the island and run it. Right, as part of its you know br you know broader positioning in the area, and remember at that time it assumed that Chiang Kai Shek and the Republic of China would prevail. Right. Um, so that was the first point. The second thing that was being debated um, was whether or not the question of sovereignty should be transferred back immediately to the Republic of China, or whether or not there needed to be a holding period. Uh, because by then there was a recognition right through this period that the island of Taiwan 
was a territory that belonged to a Chinese state. The Japanese had occupied it and it was to be returned to a Chinese state. Um, so this was the, um, the Cairo Declaration and, um, and Potsdam before it. So it was going to always be part of a Chinese state. It wasn't Japanese, it was Chinese. The question was, was whether or not it was to be handed back straight away or whether it would be progressively handed back under the watchful eye of the Americans. Now, the Department of Defense at the time was very suspicious about the capacity of Chiang Kai-shek and the, Re and the Republic of China KMT government to even run Taiwan. But in the end, the State Department's view that a Chinese front was necessary for credibility reasons actually prevailed. But this whole debate was taking place in 43-44. Right? So the island of Taiwan has featured from very early days in American calculations around American interests vis-a-vis -vis China at large. So that's your context in terms of who the stakeholders are. The US are stakeholders because the US has always seen that it has a purpose in relation to China at large. And that purpose was the transformation of China from a missionary point of view to secure China in an image and in a form that would be amenable to the vision that the Americans had for what the world should look like. And here we are again in 2024 with this question unresolved. Mm. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so f following the thread then of, well, your, your three potential outcomes, one being uh, maintaining this status quo of effectively one country, two systems, um, somewhat unresolved for the time being. And the second being uh, a resolution of some kind and that broken up into two options, one peacefully and one violently. Um, is there, do you have any, would you put any probabilities on those outcomes and in the event, say, um, China were to make a move on Taiwan. And I ask this question because so many of my guests, Professor Powell, come on and they jump right to the conclusion that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is either near term or inevitable and there will be some kind of a hot war breakouts and therefore either Taiwan needs to start arming themselves or America will be forced to do so or maybe the... Um, uh, less expected but more probable outcome is that United States takes their hands off the situation and, uh, let's, let's, um, let's, I guess, Chinese increase their influence, China increase their influence, take back the Republic of China. And, uh, because their business interests with China are far greater than their business interests with the Republic of China or Taiwan. Um, so, so what's your take on those three outcomes and the probability specifically on the, the resolution, peacefully or violently? Yeah, look, the, um, <clears throat> it's interesting that a lot of people leap to this conclusion that somehow the, uh, the People's Republic of China and the People's Liberation Army will make a preemptive move to um, militarily occupy the island. And, um, and there's actually very little evidence that they will, that that is necessarily <laughs> what they'll do. That's the first thing. I mean, the, the, the so-called evidence that people draw on is actually a, a pretty consistent formula for many, many decades that, um, you know, as a consequence of an unresolved civil war, there's a, there's an objective of the reunification of, of the territories underneath a single administration. Um, and that the preferred way of doing that is for the civil war to be resolved peacefully. But hey, you know, if it's not resolved peacefully, we're not going to throw away um, our reserve right, if you will, to resolve it through other means, but it's not a preferred way of resolving a civil war. Now, the, uh, and, and in fact, I think that the People's Liberation Army and the mainland, um, administration is in a position to take quite a different approach. And I think that approach is becoming far more evident. Uh, over the last few years, uh, that is actually not a portend of a preemptive military intervention as far as actually directly seeking to attack or to occupy the island, but it's actually based on the premise 
that the island is part of is, is the territory of the island is, is, belongs to the, a single sovereign state, and therefore whatever military actions are taken actually are uh, in the name of and for the purposes of defending the territorial integrity of the sovereign state itself. So you don't invade your own territory, you defend it. Okay. Right. Now, that's a perspective, of course, that different people from, you know, the different stakeholders will have a different view of. But unless you take the view that we're dealing with two distinct sovereign states and that these two sovereign states map to two distinct geog geographical territories, then that is actually the position, that the civil war is unfinished and that, um, you know, whatever... Uh, Measures are taken in relation to resolving the civil war uh, are civil matters, if you will. It seems to me that over the last three years or so, the uh, the mainland has uh, actively demonstrated and consistently demonstrated the capacity now to rapidly encircle the island and, in effect, establish a defensive cordon around the island. It did so after the Pelosi visit and more recently after the uh, the last visit of um, a congressional delegation from the United States. And uh, so that's the first point to remember. I think the PRC has demonstrated a, uh, a capacity now to do something that arguably 20 years ago it wasn't able to do. The second thing is that from a, um, a pure hardware point of view and a capabilities point of view, I think it's probably fair to say that Whichever, um, from whichever stakeholder's point of view you have, uh, the, the balance of military power has, I wouldn't say shifted in the favour of the PRC over anyone else in particular, but what I will say is that it has shifted away from American preponderance. So American primacy militarily within this part of the world um, is a feature of history as opposed to a feature of the present day. And that means that um, the capacity for the United States Navy to sustain, let alone achieve a victorious outcome in this part of the world, diminishes each and every day. The... And many people understand this, you know, whether you listen to uh, the uh, those who teach at the United States Naval College through to other analysts. There are very, very few American uh, military analysts who would tell you that the United States is able to prevail in a conflict. The best argument that gets mustered is that the United States in a, is in a position to send the message that... Uh, the People's Liberation Army and China would experience significant losses should it do anything, and therefore, on the basis of that, would be sufficiently deterred from doing anything. But that's a best-case argument from the American military machine now. The worst-case argument is that, in fact, the American military machine, as destructive as its capabilities are, is actually in no position at all to throw its weight around in the way that it once did. And the evidence in relation to that uh, is found in other parts of the world now. Obviously, the conflict in Ukraine, I think, is demonstrating the limitations of um, Western and American military capabilities to, um, to dominate peer um, adversaries, number one. So much so, in fact, that the supposed Wunderwaffe, you know, that, that, that cavalcade of, of military technologies that was supposed to deliver um, un, unquestioned and unbridled supremacy has actually been shown to be, you know, nothing more than things that human beings created. So it's very ordinary. Um, and in the case of a conflict in the Pacific. I think we've got that kind of situation. The situation in the Red Sea, where the Houthis are clearly, um, in many respects, out, outgunned from a pure technology point of view, actually have demonstrated that pure technology and having the best-looking tools doesn't necessarily mean that you're in a position to prevail. That's why. Right. 
The second thing is, is that the capabilities of the People's Liberation Army in many key respects has actually changed the landscape significantly. And, and I mean by that, the ability to actually today not be constrained by the so-called First Island Chain. So the historical uh, strategy was to surround uh, the Chinese mainland with military bases and a capacity to uh, deliver uh, missiles from those bases uh, into the oceans and ultimately threaten the, um, the, the Chinese mainland without fear that the Chinese were able to go past that and threaten things outside of it. Chinese hypersonic technologies uh, have enabled the Chinese to go past the First Island chain. China's industrial capacity to manufacture at high volumes and in quick pace, the kinds of um, uh, missiles that would essentially overwhelm through dint of number any of the air defence capabilities, both ground-to-air and sea-to-air defence capabilities that the United States could muster, I think, has also been a reality that has hit American military planners now fairly and squarely in the eyes. Even those who see China as the greatest threat um, no longer beat the chest that they are in a position to prevail, but actually are worried that they are no longer in a position to prevail. And I think of guys like um, Bridge Colby, for example, who I think is one of the most articulate um, advocates of a concentration of US forces into this part of the world, who recognises not only American limitations from a resource point of view, but in fact that the current array of capabilities, relatively speaking, puts the United States and its allies in the region actually in the disadvantageous position. So probability-wise, as far as the outcomes are concerned, is that should a military conflict be instigated, and I don't believe the mainland will actually be the instigator of it, by the way, um, but should it be instigated, then one, it will be, of course, incredibly disruptive. Um, there's no two ways about that. And two, I doubt that the Americans will prevail. It will be very, very destructive, however. Um, what would trigger that? That's the real question. What would trigger that? Well, I think only one thing would trigger it, and that would be moves by the legislative UN in Taiwan to recognise Taiwan as a separate territory. In other words, to go mm -hmm. through those mechanisms that I described to you earlier mm -hmm. about how the Republic of China can separate out uh, the territory of the Taiwan island and its other little islands that it currently controls as part of a distinct sovereign territory and foregoes um, the historical and continuing to exist claims over the remainder of China. Should that happen, I think um, we're likely to see a very rapid surrounding of the island. Um, right. Then the question becomes whether or not the Americans... Um, will be the first to fire, you know, or will the Taiwanese be the first to fire? Right, right, right. And, and you mentioned El Elbridge Colby. You know, he was one previous guest who I was referring to when I discussed uh, sentiment encouraging the Taiwanese army to begin increasing yep. their investment to reduce American involvement. But what does this tell you? What this tells you is that the, the, the administration on the island actually doesn't have any real capacity to manufacture any of this stuff anyway. So when they talk about the, the, the demand of the island to spend more, what it really means is that they want the island to buy more things from the United States military That's industry. Right. That's all it wants. That's what it uh, wants. Yes. Right? But, but, but here's, here's, here's the rub. And this is, I think, an interesting thing because it says something about the mentalities I guess, of, um, uh, of perhaps two, two cultures, if you will. Spending money to purchase things doesn't mean that you get the things. The capacity of the American production system to meet existing orders has been demonstrated to be inadequate. So the American system itself can't meet 
the current needs and the current orders. The Republic of China has orders in place that have been delayed. So they can place mm. more orders every day of the week. That's a but that's not point. the problem, right? They, they can place the orders, but that's not the problem. The problem is whether or not those orders can be fulfilled. Yeah, and the orders right. simply can't be fulfilled. Now, the typical um, uh, response is to say, well, you know, you throw enough money at it and at some point in time the system will be augmented with fixed capital investments, access to raw materials, mobilisation of skilled staff to a point where it will be able to increase its production output. Well, that's going to take quite some time. You know, that's the bottom line. Yep. So, um, so, so that's the first point. The second point, which I think is kind of interesting, um, and it speaks to this issue of um, whether or not there is a, a view that there should be a peaceful settlement of a civil war or not. Right? So the settle, civil war is either going to be settled peacefully um, with two outcomes. One is, is that, you know, the parties decide to essentially divorce. Um, right. Now, that's not going to happen. The probability of that as an outcome is very, very low to non-existent okay. today. In 50 years' time, it might be different. But today, the right. probability of that being an outcome is pretty much non-existent. So given that that's non-existent, what would you rather? Would you rather this kind of odd but peaceful status quo that's uneasy and complicated and difficult where people find it hard to sort of contemplate the idea that geographical territory doesn't equate to sovereignty those sorts of things, or do you want to bring it on, right? Yeah, right. right. You're either going to be part of a peaceful solution <clears throat> or you get to sustain an uneasy status quo or you're in the business of bringing it on. It's one of those. Now, nobody's game to bring it on, and for good reason. One, I think it's a crazy idea that people should provoke warfare for the sake of it if you can avoid it. Right. There are better things for human beings to do with their ingenuity, their creativity, their time and resources than to provoke and instigate warfare. But, right, so that's the first thing. You know, you can either bring it on, but they're not going to for that reason. But the second reason is, is that they're not game to bring it on because they're not likely to win. Right? Yeah. So, so provoking okay, so a war is a bad thing generally. Provoking a war when your chances of winning are low yeah. is a stupid thing. It's a, yeah, yeah, undoubtedly. This has been really refreshing because I think you 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 picked apart the question itself, saying, you know, is that the right question to be asking? And my answer at this point is no, because uh, maintaining somewhat uneasy, intense status quo, from what I've learned thus far, seems to be the most probable because – what would the trigger point be for an escalation of the quiet civil war to come to a res Well, it would be Taiwan doing something to officialize its sovereignty. And that would be too much for the People's Republic of China. Um, and given that they've demonstrated their ability to encircle the island and defend what it's deemed their territory, given their hypersonic technology, and given the degrading competency of an American military spread too thin, um, it's not a battle that the Republic of China, Taiwan, and the Americans could resolve to their favor. And so, therefore, the People's Republic of China takes back the island effectively. Why would, any, yeah. why would anybody in Taiwan trigger that event if you run through those? Jay, if only I could summarize it like that. <laughs> well, you just taught me that. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I learned this from you just now. Um, okay, this this has been great. And what I, what I really love about this, though, Professor, is – is, you know, we attacked whether or not people are asking the right question and it's frequently asked on my channel, which, which I, I find so valuable. Um, and, you know, given that America also has far greater business interests in uh, the People's Republic of China than they do in the Republic of China, um, and people always point to semiconductor manufacturing as kind of the linchpin inside uh, the Republic of China, and then they, they like 98% of the market share, but as far as I understand, that's global market share of semiconductors, not just Americans. So everyone's got a stake here. Um, and why disrupt that? Yeah, look, and I think I'll just mention one last point. And this is one that uh, people who aren't Chinese 
uh, probably don't relate to that easily and therefore they end up focusing on these sort of hard material things like semiconductors and stuff like that. And that is that there's actually deep familial ties across the straits. There are brothers and sisters who actually live on both sides of the straits who are separated during the unfolding of the conclusion of the that phase of the Civil War in 4950. Um, there are cousins um, and there are family members who continue to maintain relationships and um, and those relationships not only manifest themselves in being able to do, do business across the straits and for people to visit each other, but for many people, uh, those relationships actually bring them back into connection with their hometowns and with their home clans, the villages from which they came. And that sense of place and that sense of where you come from is actually deeply grounded in Chinese culture where individuals continue to relate very strongly to not just necessarily where they grew up, but where their hometown is. And the hometown is where your ancestors come from. Mm. And those connections are very, very deep. And the idea, the idea that you wantonly launch warfare on family members is a ludicrous idea. Yeah. Unprovoked. Yes. It's a ludicrous idea. And this is one of the reasons why this, at times, uneasy and certainly for many outside of this arrangement, what appears to be quite an odd setup, um, prevails and manages to sustain and carry on. Uh, the fact that there are movements of people, an expansion of economic and business relationships, the fact that hundreds of thousands of residents of Taiwan Island are actually living and working full-time on the mainland, um, obviously with connections back to parents and family members um, on the island, is something that should never be taken lightly. These are real human connections. Uh, this isn't just an island that's there as a launch pad or as a bulwark. These are people and families that have connections over over centuries. And, um, and unfortunately, I think in a lot of the geopolitical talk, we not only forget that, but in forgetting that, we also disrespect that. That's, a, that's another great point. And you're absolutely right. And so much of the uh, analysis and commentary and, and therefore conversation that we have specifically in the West is third party generated, right? And just like a, as an aside and not super relevant, but my one of my neighbors is uh, an aerial uh, ski coach and he's one of the best in the world. And so he's been hired by the Chinese Olympic team to train their athletes. And, uh, you know, the reason he works for, for the Chinese team is because they, they pay better than, you know, he's in Canada, his wife's Australian, but the Chinese just pay way more. They just had a global co uh, world competition in Utah and his athletes swept the podium. But, you know, he's always laughing because he listens to my podcast. He hears a lot of the, you know, sort of warmongering and fearmongering conversation and he'll talk to me about it. He's like, look, I get off work. I run the boardwalk along the ocean. I grab a beer, sit on a patio. And it's like, it's, it's not that different, you know, from a lifestyle standpoint, right? And uh, I can't, anyways. Um, okay, look, so I I want to then maybe move to another uh, very, like, assumptive conversation that we have on the channel, and that is just a, a sidestep to the uh, Chinese-American competition. And maybe we could use the sort of Ray Dalio framework of the rise and fall of empires, which puts history into a sort of sequential events. You have you know, power moving from, uh, you know, the Portuguese to the Spanish, to the Dutch, to the British, to the Americans, and therefore who's next. And the yeah. most logical answer is China. It's obviously far more nuanced than that. So what are the big misinterpretations or assumptions that people are making within that conversation? Um, yeah, that, that, it is a very big question. Look, one of the ways in which, um, some 
people and at times I think some of the work that I do tries to put things into these sort of big cycle contexts is through the idea of um, translatio imperii, which is a, a Latin idea and which was an idea that predominated in um, in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries as a way of understanding the passing of the baton um, from one empire to another. And I think that uh, certainly from a, a Western um, point of view, that process of passing on the baton has in many ways taken the forms that you have, which has been, you know, from the sort of Italian city-states to the Dutch um, and, you know, to the Spanish, the English, and, and then to the Americans. But I think that there are some nuances. And there's also a way of trying to think about why these batons change and why there is this um, – what, what's the nature of the evolution, if you will, of the, of the global political economy? To work backwards, I think where we're at today is that the baton change, if you will, is less about – a baton change from a single nation state embodying the, the the hegemonic position to another hegemonic nation state, but one in which we're starting to witness systemic change, where the world is actually becoming more decentered, um, with multi multiple poles or multiple nodes that are interacting with each other in fairly complex ways. So the visual that I often use to describe this is to ask people to think about the the images that we often see depicting neural networks, complex neural networks. So in a world where there is a single hegemon, you've obviously got a an image where there's a, a dominant energy force in the centre and everything else connects to that dominant energy force in the centre. In a decentered world or a multipolar, multinodal world, we're starting to see a world that looks a lot more like how the neural networks in the brain interact with each other, whereby there are many hotspots, um, some obviously bigger than others and firing a lot more and connected more with others. But there's actually a lot more um, uh, intranodal relationships and so it becomes a lot more web-like. Mm -hmm. Rather than the hubs and spokes configuration, we start to see a world that is a lot more web-like. And that web-like world is a world in which what I would call value flows is dissipating rather than uh, being organised around a central hub uh, that, absorbs resources and uh, and wealth from its peripheries, which has historically been the pattern, we're starting to see the emergence of multiple hubs with multiple sets of interconnectivities where the world has become a lot more fluid. That, I think, is the broad picture. So the transition that we're in now is not so much that classic one hegemon to another transition, but it's a qualitative change in the way that the global setup operates. Now, that's particularly messy because in some ways, an environment where there is a dominant hegemon is an easier one to get our heads around and it's an easier one to order the world around. But once you've got an environment where there is no single dominator, then the relationships become more fluid. Some people would say that that is a much messier world less certain, um, harder to predict. But in many ways, it also creates the environment that forces new ways of thinking about the relationship between nations. So the second point that I would raise is that the traditional uh, Western IR model views the world as a series of disconnected atoms that are then connected with each other. And each of those atoms has an agency of some sort that is um, intrinsic to itself and that it has a set of interests that are intrinsic to itself. And so this is sort of the realist 
view of the world. And then, then these, these atoms collide with each other and they've got to negotiate with each other their survival. I think this more distributed world requires us to think about the interconnections between nations, people, civilizations, and global communities that sees them less as a series of, at, of autonomous atoms that happen to bump into each other, but as a series of fundamentally interconnected relationships. So we move from a focus on the atoms to a focus on the interactions. Mm -hmm. And it's the interactions that we need to better understand. We're at a moment in global cross-civilizational and international relations where we're struggling to come to grips with addressing these interactions. The fact that we are deeply interconnected with each other is actually the starting point not the fact that we happen to be connected with each other. Mm. The interests that each of us has are interests that are shaped by our relationships. They don't get brought to the table by themselves. So this is the idea of indivisibility, that the world is so interconnected now, the butterfly effect, so to speak, that as a complex system, we need to appreciate that the concerns of one and the actions of one have implications for how others will frame their own concerns and, of course, how it will affect others. This is not an easy thing to do, but this is a necessary thing for humanity to actually work our way through, to be able to get to a point where we deeply appreciate the interconnectedness of our existence and frame our interests not as autonomous things that we bring to the table separate to everybody else's interests, but to appreciate that in the framing of our interests, we also need to understand how our interests and others' interests are tightly intermingled. Mm -hmm. So this idea of intertwining, of enmeshing, of being fully enmeshed with each other is actually the necessary starting point. And if we can begin to do that, we start to think about this issue of change not necessarily as just a handing over of the baton from one empire to the next, but as a qualitative evolution of a system, a globally interconnected system that requires actors to modify how they behave in that system for the system itself to thrive. Now, okay, I, that was a fantastic description and it made me think, made me actually start wondering about something. If at, at a high level, you know, that is sort of moving from a unipolar world to multipolar in, in some, yeah. some regard, and from a global standpoint, you could say a unipolar world is sort of like authorita authoritarian rule over the globe because you have one undisputed superpower that's able to impose their will. And therefore, you have some semblance of order um, at, at a global level. When it, Where you move to the multipolar world, um, you're relying more on these interdependencies and maybe more regional interdependencies and maybe without that sole authoritative figure, could that be, would that be part of the reason that we're, as we migrate from unipolar to multi multipolar, could that be one reason that we're seeing a bit of an outburst right now of regional conflicts as, yep. as the, okay, the, the top gangsters now yep. descending a little bit. So well, there's some, so what happens, right, um, when you've, you've been the Leviathan, Hobbes's Leviathan, providing order, what you would say is providing order to the world, but also holding the reserve right to absolve yourself from the rules that you're imposing on others in the name of maintaining order, um, when that world changes and you're no longer in a position to do that, what happens? Well, you experience a form of displacement anxiety. And that displacement anxiety, if we want to sort of psychoanalyze it, if you will, brings with it this experience of grief, 
Uh, so we've got an anxiety that the world's changing around us and that our position in a dominant position is no longer what it once was. And we are losing that. So we're going to grieve that, right? We're going to grieve the loss of our dominant position, the unquestioned, unbridled dominant position. And what happens in grief? Well, obviously, the first thing is, is, is a rejection that, in fact, that's happening. This is not the reality. Mm. You know, damn it, this is not the reality. It's not happening. I refuse to accept that this is what's going on. So there's a rejection of this evolving world around us. And we see how that manifests itself in the intensification of the role of narrative in the creation of a simulacra in which we are able to sustain a belief that the position that we hold in the world so far hasn't actually changed. Okay, yes. So a simulacra machine and the narratives that are generated and the spectacles that are manufactured around that is the first symptom actually of this process of grief against a reality that has changed. Then, of course, we get very angry. Hmm. And the first thing when we get very angry is to lash out. And we're going to lash out against those who've taken what we would say, taken away what we've lost. And we're going to lash out with an aim of recovering what we've lost. We want to regain lost primacy. So the idea for, for some, not all, but for some in the political establishment in the West is to reclaim lost primacy. And that's rationalised in all sorts of ways, most of which eventually gets covered with the cloth of a, of a thick moralism, that idea of civilizational uh, exceptionalism that comes from liberalism, that comes from the Enlightenment, that positions us as the West as the pinnacle of human civilizational achievement. And it behoves us, therefore, to either through our missionary work, transform others in this image to push out the good life, if you will, or if there is resistance to that, to overcome that resistance and vanquish it. Mm -hmm. uh, because history must march on, and we are the bearers of history's mission. That, for some, is why China poses such a daunting challenge. Because China, if we go back to our discussion around this question of Taiwan, represents the godless, barren territory that must be conquered. And unsurprisingly, the energised missionary zeal that we now see in certain pockets of the American political spectrum about China uh, is really underpinned by this idea of spiritual warfare. You know, the 1040 guys who identify a territory of the world that needs to be conquered so that God's dominion can be established. And that territory is defined by the, uh, the, the latitudes of 10 degrees and 40 degrees. And lo and behold, it covers the bulk of what we'd call West Asia, all the way through India, China, and Japan, Korea. And that part of the world is missing one key thing, and that is Christianity. So the, um, the, the, this, this, this missionary zeal that underpins that grief and the anger is driving a lot of the political violence that we see today. So that's where we're at. Um, and a lot of this comes from the internal contradictions that exist in the dominant societies. And perhaps we'll touch on that shortly because much of this 
globalised extension of political violence not only has a missionary dimension to it, that zealotry that comes with the certitude of millenarian, um, you know, purpose, but it also stems from a decay that is taking place in the home body politic, if you will, so that not only are we grieving the loss of our status in the world, but we are also grieving the loss of the dream that we offer to the world as well. Ah. So the United States is no longer in a position to be the light on the hill, which has so long animated not only its own missionary purpose, but it has given sustenance to that missionary purpose on the basis that it could deliver something that resembled the dream. And when the dream has become a nightmare for many, <clears throat> the ability to prosecute the dream globally also begins to fall apart. Okay, that last threw me for a bit of a loop. When the, that last, very last sentence for me one more time, when the dream at home begins to fall apart, those who wish to prosecute the dream, sorry, one more time. When the dream begins to fall apart at home, those who seek to prosecute that dream globally lose the foundations upon which they can persuasively prosecute that dream. Okay. Okay. That would be the idea that one of America's biggest exports has been culture for the last 40, 60 years. Um, that's what is compromised here is the American dream, the shining city on the hill, you know, they're, um, that, that's what is becoming increasingly challenging to communicate to the rest of the world why life is is yep. superior in the American dream. Well, the model's falling apart. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. the model, uh, and so you've got these spiritual dimensions, but you've also got a real economy dimension. The real economy dimension underpins, in a sense, the ability for the spiritual war to deliver. There's only so much spiritual, spiritual warfare can do if you can't, in a sense, walk the walk. And the real economy that is unfolding and has unfolded over, say, the last 40 years <clears throat> in the United States has delivered an economic model that actually can't deliver the material outcomes for the target countries, let alone deliver the material elements of the American dream itself for the majority of Americans. And so over the last 40 years, the structure of the political economy of the United States and other Western nations has evolved from one in which finance capital played a played an enabling role in the economic logic of development to a model in which finance capital and its own dynamics becomes the purpose itself. So we move from a world where finance is mobilised to enable other things to happen in what I would call the real economy of use value to one in which finance is mobilized in its own name to monetize fictitious capital claims on future value. That's abstract, so I'll put it in very concrete terms now. We've basically seen the explosion of the industry and markets for financial instruments Mm -hmm. which are claims on future value, whether they're stocks or bonds or derivatives or futures. All of these instruments <clears throat> provide the holder with a right to claim value in the future, either by way of an income, which you would get from an interest payment or from a dividend from stocks, or from a capital gain, 
in the event of you being able to liquidate that particular asset in the future. But those fictitious, cap- what I would call fictitious capital, which are claims on future value, they begin, they become tradable themselves mm-hmm. because I can create claims on the future today and I can create those claims very quick and easy. I just need lawyers to do that, right? Lawyers and technology enable me to manufacture claims on the future pretty much with keystrokes. Once I've manufactured this, I can then create liquid markets for that where claims on the future can be exchanged for money today. And then they become tradable, which means that during the course of the life of this fictitious capital instrument between today and maturity date, Mm -hmm. that instrument can be turned over countless numbers of times where the total aggregate value trading volume of that instrument far exceeds the value of the future claim. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens when you have to redeem this claim at some point in the future? We've got some problems Mm -hmm. because the only way you can redeem the value is to actually kickstart a new instrument. Yeah. Right. So we're going to call what we call refinancing, right? We're going to create a new instrument today that allows us to settle the obligations of the expiring instrument without having to place a claim on the real economy. We can kick this can down the road. Now, Minsky described this phase, of course, in terms of being Ponzi finance. Sure. We borrow today to settle the accounts of yesterday before having to make a claim on the real economy. This is the dominant pattern of contemporary American political economy, and not just American political economy, but the dominant pattern of the G7. It's not the first time, by the way, that this pattern has taken place. So you described the Dalio model um, of the transition from these different um, dominant merchant powers historically. And I suspect that um, uh, Dalio draws a lot of his inspiration, even if it's um, inadvertently from the work of an Italian sociology historian um, called Arrighi, who in a book called The Long 20th Century, describes 700 years of global capital expansion through the phases of, you know, Genoa, um, Florence, the Italian merchant cities, uh, into the Spanish, the Dutch, the English and the US. And he described this as an unfold, as a repetition, as a repetition of a particular pattern. And the pattern was basically that in the early days of a dominant hegemonic system, the capital would be mobilized in real economy production systems. And as you do that, you accumulate uh, growing amounts of money. So, um, so these production systems enable the accumulation of capital. And at some point, there's so much money capital accumulated that you can't keep investing that in production systems unless you expand physically. So that starts to explain the physical expansion. But at some point, those with the money capital progressively vacate productive capital work and become the bankers of the next generation of productive capital, which usually is in a different country. So the Dutch took over the production systems from the Italian city-states. But as the Dutch accumulated large amounts of money capital through production and trade, in time, the Dutch became the financiers of British capitalism Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and abandoned production systems themselves. And the British eventually became financiers of a network of production systems through their colonial networks with a reducing proportion of production in their own home. And we're seeing that replay itself again in the United States. And so what do you get? You get in the US these current debates about hollowing out and and deindustrialization. But deindustrialization has happened as a direct consequence of the fundamental drivers of the American political economy. So you don't get to reindustrialize, and this is the real lesson here, you don't get to reindustrialize America in the way that Americans want or the American political (coughs) elite perhaps talk about without tackling 
the excessive weight of finance capital within the American political economy. You can't have the both. So whilst the system is unbalanced by an excess of finance capital for its own sake, you're not going to get the allocation of national resources in these other areas. And a great example of that not only is the massive expansion of things like FX, trading, um, the stock market, etc., but the expansion of markets like health insurance and the role of the, quote, health expenditure sector in the United States. Health expenditure now makes up 18% of the US GDP. <clears throat> the global average is about 10%. This 18% does what? Well, a health system's critical KPI should be increased life expectancy and reduced infant mortality. It would seem to me that they're two reasonable KPIs for a health system. Sure. And yet on both of those measures, the United States is heading in the wrong direction. But mm. healthcare costs are rising. So the GDP impact of the health system is a positive impact. That's not helping the body politic, right, ultimately sustain the story of the dream. And if that's the case, countries around the world have every reason to start to look elsewhere. Right, right, right. So using healthcare as that example, um, the continued financialization of that industry, the derivative market built on top of it and on top of that and on top of that creates this GDP effect that is actually not correlated at all to the performance of the industry whatsoever. Correct. Right. Yeah, okay. And then when you were discussing, uh, okay, so to so the Dutch, for example, you know, they they ruled the era of conquest because they, they had the most competitive technology at the time, which was ships, really fast ships. They could build them quickly. And they built the first stock exchange to finance these conquests publicly, but they determined they could build them cheaper by outsourcing that labor to the UK. Um, and so they essentially financed the growth of the British economy. Let's, you know, you guys will design the ships here in Holland, but let's have them built at that funny little island across the North Sea. Uh, and this built up the British economy, which eventually, you know, you play that game forward um, again and again and again. But so de deindustrializing is kind of natural because as an economy becomes more affluent, the living uh, standards rise and nobody wants the dirty jobs at the bottom. So you outsource those to a cheaper economy. Uh, but reindustrializing is not as simple as unwinding that process. Um, now that's kind of obvious, but I mean, that's, that's what I took it. I was, um, I found it quite complex, the nuance of, of the um, the marriage of, of a, a financialized economy and the resistance to reindustrialization, um, but I, I think I'm with you. Am I am I recapping this somewhat accurately? Yeah. Again, I wish I could summarize it like you. Right? <laughs> um, but um, but there's plenty of studies that show that as financial products became more prevalent and complex, played a greater role within the domestic economy in the United States, that employment levels in traditional industry, manufacturing industry declined. And there is actually a cause and effect relationship between the two. I should add one caveat in all of this, and that is that from a pure output point of view, measured in dollar terms, American manufacturing has not declined. Um, it continues to produce stuff. And so the concern in terms of how it plays out as far as the political economy or the body politic is, is concerned is that it affects livelihoods. Right? So when you look at the demography and the geographical distribution of the impacted demographies, the processes of hollowing out whereby automation and the uh, continual introduction of technologies into American manufacturing over the last 40 years, it's affected large groups of people who have been concentrated in particular parts of the United States. Now, what, what's the real challenge in all of this? And what's the lesson in all of this? Well, the lesson in all of this is that firstly, you've got a distributional problem. So trade has been blamed for the loss of jobs. Trade's a consequence of a change in the location of 
production systems. It's not actually the cause so much as the consequence. That's probably the first thing I would say. But if trade delivers in aggregate terms net beneficial outcomes, the problem that nation states have is how do you share those benefits? If you can share those benefits across your economy and across society and use those benefits to enable those who have been displaced through these processes of change to adapt and take advantage of new opportunities, then you've succeeded in growing aggregate welfare and doing it in a fair way. But if you enable the proceeds of of trade to be concentrated in the hands of a relative few, then over time you get concentrated groups and large groups of disenfranchised and understandably angry people. Mm-hmm. And we see that today. But so, you know, that's that that's part of the issue. So if finance capital sees greater opportunity to essentially expand itself through the work of finance itself, making money from money, Hmm. then why would you do something else? Because when you start to think about what's actually going on between these two production systems, the production system of financial instruments and the production systems of uh, real real value in an economy, what you've got in the real economy is a system that requires the exercise of work to transform energy and materials, right? Human beings on this planet are basically part of an energy transformation network. We are ourselves the embodiment of energy in the world. Science tells us that. We consume energy, nutrition, food, etc., etc., and we are able then to transform that through motion into other things. So energy is continually being transformed, right? So this takes people back to basic science. On top of that, we've got machines. Now, machines are also energy transformation tools. Firstly, they're the embodiment of energy transformations. We've taken raw materials and we've transformed them to make a machine. And now we use a machine to take other raw materials and add that together with our our energy, mental energy and physical energy, to make new things that are useful. Now, this process of transformation of energy into useful things takes time, right? It takes time to take raw materials from point A, put it through a process of heat and motion and manipulation and addition and subtraction to distill it into something else that then gets added to something else through another process in a different place to ultimately give us, you know, a smartphone, right, that comes from all of these different places of the world. Compare that to being able to monetize value Mm -hmm. through the trading of a financialized instrument. Right. As I said, you can create a financial instrument with keystrokes. Yeah. It takes no time. The trading is instantaneous. So you're able to monetize value quicker, easier, constantly in that system than you could ever do in an energy transformation system. Right, right. So where does, so where does money capital go? If money capital's driver is to accumulate more of itself, its driver is to accumulate more money capital. Mm -hmm. So it will always be attracted to where the turnover's quickest, right? To trading, to the speculative dynamics of, of marketize instruments where there is deep markets with high liquidity. This is what happens. You take the total value of global trade, $40 trillion or thereabouts, and you compare that to the total value of global FX and derivatives transactions, 1,200 trillion, something like that. Hmm. 
per year. Right? Compare those two worlds. Which one delivers improved living standards to the majority of people? And which one delivers improved living standards to a minority of people? Fed data shows, for example, that over 90% of the value of the New York Stock Exchange is owned by 10% of Americans. Right? We know that quantitative easing over the last 15 years has actually put more money capital into the hands of those who are involved in the processes of trading securities and other assets, capital assets, than into the pockets of households. So we get asset price inflation, Mm -hmm. property values bubble, but we also get this performance on the stock exchange, which is we look at the index and say, wow, the economy is doing great. I tend to think that the more that goes and the more people intuitively say, wow, the more I'm concerned that the distance between the claims being made in the world of fictitious capital circulation are becoming detached from the capacity of the real world to meet those value claims at some point. In other words, as asset values grow, driven by increased liquidity, Mm -hmm. we're actually undermining our ability to meet the needs of people in the real economy. Yeah, okay. I'm... completely agree with that i mean it 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 begs the question like to to massively simplify when's the bill coming due because i you know i I see it we live in a very financialized economy that's a crazy ratio if the global gdp is around 40 trillion but the you know total financial global financial markets is somewhere around you said 1200 trillion and and that's that's only the fx that's one of the fx add the rest add the rest right right Right. But the whole point simply is is that is that distinct gap between the world of financialized trading versus the world of energy transformation and right. the exchange of real value. And at some point, the focus on the world of energy transformation and the, the exchange of real value always trumps. And we see that particularly in moments where conflict emerges. Mm. And so when the financial sanctions were imposed on Russia in early 2022, the belief was that you could cripple and destroy an economy from finance down. That entire strategy was premised on the idea that the economy is finance. What the Russian experience reminds us is that the economy of value creation actually begins in the physical world. Finance is the enabler of that, but it's not the determiner of that per se. And so not only was Russia not just a gas station pretending to be a nation, It was a real economy that controlled the most important thing in an economic system, energy. Mm -hmm. Because if an economic system is an energy transformation system, then you've got to address two core things. You've got to provide food for people and you've got to provide fuel for machines. Right. And if you can do those two things, then your economy won't collapse regardless of the financial sanctions that are being imposed. Which is what we And Russia happens to be one of the world's biggest producers of food for people and fuel for machines. Yeah. Yeah. That reminded us around the world of the materiality of economies. And now, of course, we're looking at China, where China is being accused of overcapacity. Well, The flip side of over, and I'll touch on overcapacity shortly, but the flip side of overcapacity is what you'd say is chronic undercapacity elsewhere, right? You don't get one without the other, right? You don't get one without the other. And this issue of overcapacity is largely 
a political narrative. I, I need to expand on the, the definition of overcapacity for me. Yeah, sure. The argument that's run is that China produces too much and okay. it doesn't consume enough and therefore it needs to export what it produces too much of. <clears throat> okay. And that is made out to be a line of criticism. Sure. Interestingly, that line of criticism doesn't get applied to other countries that have export services as well, historically. Japan, mm -hmm. North Korea, Germany, as classic cases in point. This is Janet Yellen going aside. to traveling to Beijing six months ago, telling, uh, asking yeah. for slower production cycles? That's right. Now, okay. um, what we're seeing, of course, is, is a couple of things. One is, is that um, Chinese manufacturing output has grown and continues to grow. In other words, it produces more. That's the first thing. As it produces more, interestingly, a larger proportion of that is being absorbed domestically, which means that income growth domestically is also growing. So the Chinese manufacturing sector, which is what the focus is on, not only has it produced more and more and more and more over the years, but as it's done that, a larger proportion of what it produces gets consumed domestically. So back in 1995, um, uh, China's uh, domestic e economy consumed around 87% of its manufactured outputs, 1995. Hmm. By, no by 2004, China's domestic economy consumed... 82% of its output, bearing in mind that output was growing. In other words, it was exporting 18% of its output. So the export to output ratio grew from 13% to 19%. Oh, hold on. Whilst they were grew. exporting exporting 87% in 95. No, no, no. Domestically consuming 87%, exporting 13 In 95. So in 95. Okay. By, ni by 2004, nine years later, having entered into uh, the WTO, China was exporting uh, 18%. Okay. <clears throat> by 2021, that had dropped back to 15%, despite the massive growth in output capacity. And, and then what you that's gotta, telling yeah, us... Right. Right. is that the domestic economy is growing sufficiently to absorb output growth. Interestingly, electric vehicles is a great classic case in point. Maybe not so classic because it's so new. But between 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, those four years, the absorption rate domestically hovered between 75 and 85% year on year as output grew. Interestingly, for the first seven months this year, absorption rate is the amount grow, of manufacturing that is consumed at home. Correct, right? Of NEVs, new energy okay, vehicles. NEVs, okay. So, so these EVs, almost three quarters of them, basically, um, were being absorbed domestically, up to eighty-five percent. And interestingly, in the last seven months, just in this sector alone, outputs continued to grow over ninety percent is now being sold domestically. Over 90% of output is being sold domestically. Okay. So this idea that China overproduces uh, uh, is really, um, uh, in many regards, a misinterpretation of the dynamics of Chinese manufacturing growth and domestic consumption. The other thing about this process is that it's leading to a very interesting phenomenon. And that is this idea that we are, a, we are witnessing the, uh, the emergence of an economic model that sees value transferred to consumers or value transferred to buyers by way of reduced prices. And that's happening because of intense competition right up and down the supply chain. The competition is intense. Price competition is crazy in these markets. So price competition is driving 
the pricing closer and closer to marginal cost. So profit levels, of course, the profit margins are being squeezed all the time through intense competition. And the only way to deal with this, of course, from an enterprise point of view, there's two ways. One is to pursue volume growth, right? So that's one. And the second, and you do that by continuing to expand output, investing in fixed capital so that you can get, um, you know, more capacity, either domestically or internationally, and also driving uh, increased capacity utilisation. So we're going from a situation where on average Chinese industry capacity utilisation is in the low 70, 72, 73% to an EV environment where at the moment capacity utilisation is over 85%. So they're pushing their machinery at the moment a lot harder. The second thing, of course, is to recover margins or to reclaim margin growth is to innovate. So you can innovate to drive your cost down further to re regain margin without passing the, co the cost savings through for a period until competition kicks in. Or you've got to introduce mm. new products where the competition isn't as intense, where you've got a little bit of room for margin again. So these are the dynamics that are happening as a result of this dramatic expansion of high-tech manufacturing coming out of China. So globally, we are now in an era where buyers around the world are able to access products in all sorts of areas, not just cheap toys, but in high-tech areas, whether they're electric vehicles or um, solar plants or batteries, at prices that have never been seen before. So for the first time, for a long, long time in human economic history, we're shifting to a model where buyers are being priced in through abundance, through productive abundance. Mm -hmm. So it's not overcapacity, it's abundance. Right. As opposed to an environment where buyers are priced out through maintaining margins that is made possible by confected scarcity. So... Industries with limited competition, high barriers to entry, are able to artificially constrain market availability, confected scarcity, so as to maintain margins. Mm -hmm. That model is breaking down. That model is breaking down. And globally, this is incredibly significant because if economic development and economic systems are energy transformation systems, as I've argued, then the ability for countries to access energy generating and capturing and storage technologies at cost cheaper than they've ever had before opens the pathway for these countries to undertake economic development that they have been until now unable to do so. And that further propels the development of multipolarity, mm -hmm. right? So this ties back to that discussion we had earlier around that growing web of interconnectedness. Yes. Because as countries develop low-cost energy systems that enable them to participate in energy transformation processes, manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, they are also able to do that by enhancing their energy sovereignty. And countries that have relative energy sovereignty are countries that are also able to deal with the risks of others imposing their will on them yeah. because that's, the, that's one of your big vulnerable points. Yes. And that reinforces the robustness of multipolarity. Sure it does. Okay. And so, I mean, just to, to recap some of this, the same as – you know, we mentioned the sort of the Dutch financing the British economy by outsourcing labor. America's done that in, in China. Obviously, we know this. But what less people are paying attention to is that as the Chinese economy has grown by eight, nine percent for the last 20, 30 years, uh, their their consumption of this manufacturing um, output has grown, you know, in tandem. And uh, and. Um, uh, what is remarkable about that is that's probably why the Trump tariffs uh, 
on Chinese goods didn't really have any economic impact whatsoever um, because the uh, exports from China aren't the problem. Um, they did score political points for Trump, which gets back to your point about um, trying to regain lost primacy and, as you said, lashing out at those we deem who took what's ours, right? And so the, the yeah. tariffs do feed the narrative at home and they can say, look, you know, uh, we're, we're ceding power to China. Let's regain it with some tariff action. It's not going to work, but it is going to feed the narrative that we're doing something about this, correct? Look, and there are some, there, there's, there's been a study by David Orta, um, an American economist who's studied the impact of um, trade and technology change on uh, job displacements across the US for many decades. And he, he and his co-authors published a paper earlier this year <clears throat> looking at the effects of Trump tariffs and basically concluded that at best they had no effect. Um, mm. At worst, they actually disadvantaged some of the intended beneficiary communities, but it did deliver a political dividend. So I think that your observation is spot on and it's backed up by some of the academic research. Mm. The other thing that's happening is that Chinese exports and Chinese trade relationships uh, are changing in form as well. So, you know, in the early 2000s, the predominant relationships were with the mature markets of the G7, the transatlantic markets. But by 2020, China's trade relationships with the global south was growing at a rate that was many times faster than its trade relationships with the global north, and that, in fact, the global south was becoming a more important economic partner, actually, in aggregate terms than the global north was for China. Yes, right. Uh, right. So the United States and Europe, simply put, was, relatively speaking, no longer as important to China as the rest of the world. And that continues to... That, that pattern it continues to roll out. So the Trump tariffs delivered a political um, effect. It mobilised the politics of nostalgia. It didn't have an economic effect, which leads, I think, to an interesting response from Trump, which was a comment he made at that uh, rally that he did in, in, in Detroit, from memory, where he talked about the bloodbath rally. Right? So many people will, of course, remember the bloodbath comments Yep. Most people will forget the fact that he also said, but I'd welcome Chinese EV manufacturers to set up shop in the United States. <laughs> now, that observation is actually the pivotal one because the key of addressing these issues is always not through trade per se. Trade's an effect but it's to address your foundational productive capabilities in the first instance. So there's no point cutting off trade or pricing trade if you're not in a position to address production. You can't yeah. sell what you, what you don't produce. Yeah. So you've got to produce yeah. what you want to sell. Whether or not the political environment in North America will enable an expansion of Chinese EV plants in the foreseeable future will be an interesting thing to watch. I have no idea whether the body politic will accept hmm. that idea, um, but the fact that it was recognised as a, a response to the current situation was, I think, a very interesting, uh, if indirect, concession that the previous responses to the problem hadn't worked. Mm. Okay. Now, and you you're, you mentioned that the global South has become far more important uh, to China than North America and Europe, more densely populated countries. That means more consumers for Chinese goods. I mean, yeah, you can see the countries behind me that we're, we're talking to here. And uh, essentially the energy transformation initiatives that China has been making in these countries. Lima just got their first, uh, well, it was 50 miles north of Lima, but South America just got their first deep water port on the West Coast. There's been dozens of these deals done just like that, the Belt and Road Initiative effectively. Um, 
uh, I'd say massive domination over the majority of Muslim countries locked into Chinese infrastructure deals. Would you agree with that? And and it's it's through these initiatives that maybe also China, because a big a big pushback. I'd love to get your thoughts on this against. Uh, uh, I guess Chinese success would be the demographic challenges. Now, almost every country, aside from a handful of African nations and India, are facing massive demographic challenges. But China is facing some big ones, and maybe one of the solutions to that is roping in global South economies into their network effects. Uh, yeah, is that foreseeable? Absolutely. Look, uh, an aging population. Um, uh, has a few dimensions to it. One is is that, in fact, people are healthier as they age. Right? So we know this. So longevity, other than the recent data in the United States, um, would, you know, shows that, that people are living longer and healthier in, in China. What that means is that they're also more, more productive longer. The data on health system costs also shows that the bulk of uh, uh, the, the costs of ageing actually comes when someone gets close to dying. Right. So, so long as an, uh, an aging person remains healthy, um, their cost impact on the social system, on the economic system, is actually not as great as one would initially think. So that's the first thing to remember, is that it's only when you're close to death's door that you become a, a significant cost burden. The second thing is, is obviously a concern around uh, the available labour force. And the response to that, and time will tell the extent to which this response is adequate, is automation. Uh, if people can't do things, then machines will do things. Um, or machines will help people do things. So that's the second response. And we're starting to see quite clearly a dramatic intensification of automation in the Chinese economy in ways that, um, that even 10 years ago nobody foresaw. So China is now the world's largest implementer of robotic systems industrially. It has rolled out the necessary communications infrastructure systems to enable that to happen. Um, you know, I think one of your previous guests, David Golden, will have spoken a lot about um, uh, the, uh, the 5G networks, industrial 5G networks that rolled out across China, without which you don't get automation, right? So you've right. got to have the ability to deliver instructions, complex instructions to a network of machines quickly and cheaply so that the machines will do what they're instructed to do. All of that is being rolled out and being rolled out very successfully. The next thing then is to deal with this issue of um, the work that needs to be done by younger people. Right? So the work that needs to be done by younger people uh, can be done by developing economic relationships with countries where there's a lot of younger people. And that, of course, is the Global South. Uh, so that's your next piece. Hmm. And as part of all of this, too, you've also got to have a view towards the human capital of your society, which is that uh, as they get older and you've got fewer sort of younger bodies for whom the physical dimensions of work is, is, is in a sense, an easier part, you've got to have ways of enabling your population to be able to do the mental work. So the training and the education investments that have been made over the last 20 years have actually laid the foundations for the kind of employment that is likely to be increasingly dominant over the next 20 to 40 years. Now, if you look at the kinds of roles that exist in, in an economy and you generically categorise them into, you know, four things. So visualise a, um, a quadrant <clears throat> and on one axis you've got um, manual and cognitive, and on the other axis, you've got repetitive and non-repetitive. The transition that's taking place is that robots are increasingly doing the manual repetitive work. Computers are increasingly going to do your cognitive repetitive work. So human beings necessarily must find their ways to the non-repetitive dimensions of manual and cognitive work whatever those things happen to be. Right. And training people with education is fundamental to enabling humans to fulfil those parts of the, um, the, the occupation matrix. And I think China's actually been doing that for the past 40 to 50 years. So interestingly, as China 
initially embarked on this on this one China policy to deal with the risks of an exploding population, and those risks really revolved around concerns around being able to feed the population. They've also invested in the population from a capabilities point of view, so that what population there is are actually highly capable and skilled people. So dealing with demography requires a package deal approach to the challenges and the opportunities ranging from healthcare to make sure that people are healthier longer and are capable of contributing longer, educating a population so that they're able to fulfil the non-repetitive cognitive and manual roles that are what humans can do Mm. and therefore deliver the productivity gain so that we can continue delivering material welfare with fewer workers proportionately, and where younger workers are necessary, extending the networks out and creating those network connections into places with young populations. Now, you don't do that with a click of a finger, and you don't do that as a, you know, a 12-month or an electoral cycle initiative. You've got to do this as a sustained and evolving policy orientation and china's been doing that yeah you know uh, man so it doesn't paint uh, a rosy picture for when you talk about demographic challenges are amplified depending on the healthy lifespan of those citizens and so if we're getting sick in our 50s and 60s versus living healthy until our 80s that's a very different cost burden, one that doesn't look great uh, for Americans. That's that's for sure. Solving the labor shortage issues, you have automation versus co-opting younger economies. China's done a great job of that with um, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, whereas America has been far more focused on, I don't know, exporting U.S. dollars and financial products. So, like it's not the same. Yeah, and this this issue of co-opting the younger workers actually brings a, another dimension to this um, multipolarity dynamic, right? Because if an economy is short of workers of whatever type, one response is to facilitate um, uh, migration, right? Right. skilled and unskilled migration. Right. That's yes. one response. But China doesn't tend to do that. So your alternative response is to take the work out. Yeah. If you're not bringing the workers in, you've got to take the work out. Right. Now, as you take the work out, you start to transform these other places. Right? So this kick starts the economic development path for these other places. So rather than going into these places, taking their natural resources, both resources from the ground and their natural resources of people, mm-hmm. the emerging <laughs> multipolar landscape is starting to see taking fixed capital out to people by mm. building new factories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as part of a holistic strategy of dealing with domestic demo- demographic challenges. Um, I'm right. not saying that it's a conscious strategy, but it's actually how it fits together. Right, right, okay. And then, you know, the reinvestment of education, I mean, back to our, our Dutch friends, I think at the peak of the, the Dutch empire, something like 12% of global books were published in Holland. And my audience can fact check me here, but like 18% of global universities were, were also located um, within the Dutch empire, I think within Holland. Yeah. Okay, so maybe to like close the loop on this, uh, how I interpret this is if the, the balance of this decade and probably the balance of the next 15, 20 years. I think we're in for a pretty fascinating moment in history and an era in history here. And, you know, we're, we're moving from an era of certainty and globalization. And, you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old. My whole life has been the, the era of globalization, increased access to cheaper and more variety of goods and all this stuff and more cooperation. And that era is probably over. Whatever's next is to be defined, but we'll live through it and we'll see it and I'll raise my kids in it. And so what's the best course of action there? It's, you know, we kept on coming back to the idea of sovereignty today. And I, I find myself landing there on a personal level. It's like personal sovereignty, personal ownership and accountability. It's probably more important than ever in times like this, changing uh, 
of the guard and, and, and changing of frameworks and empires. And so in terms of personalizing what is a very global situation, the, the takeaways for, for me at this point are, you know, how can I build as much sovereignty into my entire existence, you know, um, and uh, whether that's the education of my kids and the, you know, my food supply, I'm not quite sure, but you know, how do you, how do you, how do you process and, and internalize yeah. and, and then action some of what you study? Oh, yeah, look, they're great questions and um, I'll tackle them in two parts. First, sure. I'll paint a bit of a picture at, a, at the sort of macro level and then let's see how it goes at an individual level. Yeah, yeah. At a macro level, this issue of sovereignty, I think um, uh, not only is it emerging as the principal concern, but it's emerging in a way that uh, sees sovereign nations recognise that becoming sovereign doesn't mean jettisoning the idea of interacting deeply with others. So it's sovereign in the context of our deep inter interactions with each other. So this goes back to that philosophical or conceptual way of thinking about the world. The practical dimensions of that, of course, means, well, for instance, um, how do I, as a nation state, um, maintain sovereignty over the information landscape of my country, whilst at the same time enabling the flow across borders of information and data right, without one threatening the other. Uh, these are new balances that are going to need to be sought. Similarly, you know, this issue of capital flows, how do I enable the circulation of capital um, through my economy whilst at the same time reducing the risk of my economy being susceptible to um, to essentially anti-sovereign interventions by others through sanctions um, and other forms of prohibitions. Um, so they're the macro challenges about how do we um, find sovereignty without jettisoning interactivity or interoperability. And there's lots of things that... Um, we can explore it, you know, maybe on another occasion about how nations are starting to think about that. At a personal level, you know, I often think about, and you touched on this, uh, what is it about us as human beings that makes us distinct from other kinds of beings in the world, whether it's a rock or a light or a table or whatever it is or, 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 an, or another type of animal? And one of the things that we do have is an ability to reflect on ourselves and our place in the world, which seems to be quite a distinctly human thing, and our ability to also um, uh, enable the world to be framed in new ways continually, our ability to be creative and innovative. Now, that requires a grounding, I think, in, in, in all sorts of knowledges that have been handed down to us through the generations, both in terms of the classic STEM areas, you know, science and technology, um, which I think are absolutely foundational to understanding the world, as well as mathematics and material sciences, um, but also having a grasp on philosophy, on the social sciences, <clears throat> and on, you know, difficult questions of ethics. All of that helps us to be competent, and creative people. And by that, we are able to empower ourselves to navigate the world. But in a material sense, what does sovereignty look like? Of course, there are those who will say, going off grid makes you sovereign. And that's your classic, we're going to become sovereign and disconnected from the world. We do need to think about how we interact with others in a way that empower others so that it also empowers ourselves. So through collaborating with others, we are also able to make ourselves more independent and stronger, right? Now, these are a whole series of paradoxes that I think we need to navigate. So I can be more energy independent by having a distributed network, renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. But I can also become more powerful by having a distributed network of batteries that I share with a community because I won't always need some of the energy and others might need more at different times. Mm -hmm. But So I think we've got to become more creative again around how we navigate paradoxes and find uh, 
are ways in which empowering ourselves empowers others and vice versa. And we can do that at an individual level and we can do that at a whole of community or at a national level. So, you know, you talk about how you empower children through education and training and providing them with um, examples of how to lead a life. But in doing that and enabling them, them to uh, cultivate an ability to autonomously navigate the world, that also enhances your ability to relate with them as well. Because if, in a sense, if you're the dominant provider, then in so much as you may be the, um, the, the, the hegemon, you're also trapped in a relationship where you don't have autonomy because you have embedded obligations. Yeah, so I think that uh, the challenge for us in this, in this era is to understand um, the idea of sovereignty not through the lens of being autonomous and detached from the world, but understand sovereignty as how we can become empowered whilst at the same time empowering others. Right? If we can navigate our way through these paradoxes, then I think we could end up on the other side, so to speak, in a world that is um, not a world without conflict and without differences, but in a world that reshapes behaviour, that compels us to address differences um, in less <clears throat> kinetic ways, right? Um, and because our interests are too mutually intertwined to, in a sense, resort to kinetic solutions as our first port of call. Mm. So that's the sovereign mm -hmm. piece, right? Um, that, that idea that sovereignty is actually not divisible from our interactions with others. Your sovereignty and my sovereignty are actually all the more stronger by virtue of our collaboration. Yeah, right. Well, okay, absolutely. That, that makes all the sense in the world. Um, and I, I feel like we just cracked the door open to a part two. I'm, I admittedly have not read China Trust and Digital Supply Chains, uh, Dynamics of a Zero Trust World, your yeah. book. This, I, I feel like this is almost a segue into some of those concepts, uh, to maybe some degree. So, um, I'd love to cover that. I think I yeah. need to read the book first. <laughs> yeah, by all means. Um, look, it was a book that, uh, about blockchains with Chinese characteristics in a sense. And uh, initially it was piqued by a, a paradox as well, which is, you know, blockchains emerged in the United States, um, you know, off the back of second, uh, Nakamoto's white paper, um, very much from a libertarian um, stick-it-to-the-man tradition, right? Yeah. And, uh, and yet... By 2019, so 10 years basically after uh, the white paper, the Bitcoin white paper, Xi Jinping had announced that blockchain was a critical piece of infrastructure for China's economic development. Now, how does a technology that emerged in a, in a libertarian stick it to the man environment yeah. become a central piece of technology in an environment that most people would say is not libertarian and certainly not one that encourages sticking it to the man. Mm -hmm. And so that opened up this examination for me um, around this particular aspect of distributed ledgers, um, obviously building on my own work in supply chains, cross-border finance, um, digital finance, and delving specifically into this one, one dimension of um of of domestic and and multinodal information flows and in some ways the way i describe this multipolar world you could almost think of this as a as a blockchain network of nodes right um of interconnected responsibilities to the integrity of the system as a whole where mm -hmm. no single actor <coughs> can um uh, capriciously uh, undermine another actor um, and where the interests of every actor in terms of the validity of the data on that network is actually intertwined with each other, mm. right? So the stronger I run my, my node and the more that I do the right thing to maintain network security and network integrity, 
the better it is for you as well. Right? So, um, so I think that there are real parallels between this way of thinking about distributed ledgers and this idea of a multipolar world. But um, yeah, I'd love to have a talk about you know the, the nitty gritty of uh, cross border distributed ledgers, cross border payments, digital currencies, and supply chains because. That's yeah. a part that obviously animates a lot of discussions these days, you know, de-dollarization and, you know, and all that sort of thing. Oh, 100%, 100%. I'd love to have you back on and, and go down that rabbit hole with you. <laughs> uh, Professor, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself and learned a ton, most importantly, which is just an absolute blast. So thank you very much for your time. Absolute pleasure, Jay, and I'll be happy to come back and chat. I'm sorry I took up so much time, but the questions really, in a sense, demanded a, a thoughtful and thorough reflection rather than a little quick one-liner. So I hope that you and your viewers at least develop ways of thinking about the world that helps them navigate the challenges of our times. Yeah, 100%, 100%. I have no doubt about that. If you guys want to hear a part two, let me know in the comments. But uh, Professor Powell, this has been an absolute blast. Thanks again. And I look forward to doing it again. I can't wait.